Good afternoon, everyone. So before we get started, um, I just wanted to go over a couple of housekeeping items. So your phones have been automatically muted. Uh, please use the Q&A panel or the WebEx chat functionality to ask questions during the webcast, and Nate and I will do our best to answer them at the conclusion. So welcome to the latest installment of Galen Webcast. Um, this will be focused on an introduction to the Mirth interface engine. My name is Ryan Hunt, and I'm a managing consultant with Galen, primarily focused on interfaces, including ConnectR, Rhapsody, and Mirth. And today I am joined by Nate Bessa, who is a technical consultant out of the Boston office and has worked on custom programming, interface, and conversion projects. So I want to first provide some background around how we at Galen have utilized Mirth in recent projects. So first up, we've used it as a complex data transformer. Uh, we were recently tasked with parsing CCDA documents from Epic and Athena into discrete HL7 data for consumption into an HIE. And so these data types include encounters, allergies, medications, results, procedures, and social history. We've also used Mirth as a centralized hub um, to serve as a large-scale transportation and transformation mechanism for patient messages. Um, this work was done for a major patient portal vendor um, when they were integrating with multiple EHRs. And most recently, uh, we were tasked with migrating an Allscripts client's existing interfaces from the legacy interface engine ConnectR to Mirth Connect. Um, and this one we're really excited about. Um, you know, Nate uh, put a ton of work into this. Um, and really, it's a lot of Allscripts clients today are trying to make the decision to uh, migrate off of ConnectR which is the, the legacy interface engine, which I mentioned previously. And really the only option, um, you know, before now was to move towards Rhapsody. And, you know, Rhapsody is a great engine. We use Rhapsody quite a bit, um, but maybe, you know, you already have a uh, Mirth installation for other interfaces in your organization, or your people are already trained on Mirth. So it just makes more sense for you to to move to Mirth um, for your Allscripts interfaces. So now there's an option, which we're, like I said, really excited about. So I'm gonna be presenting a brief overview of Mirth while trying to highlight some of the more interesting and important features, along with a quick demonstration on how to spin up a basic channel. So then I'll be handing it over to Nate to go over logging and maintenance within Mirth Connect as well as some more advanced concepts of channel development uh, that were utilized in the Connect Art and Mirth migration work, which I previously mentioned. So, but before we get started, um, you know, we just like to extend our first poll to the audience to try to understand who all has joined us today. So let me open up the first poll. And really we're just looking for you know, what is your experience level with Mirth Connect? Um, I've never used it, novice, intermediate, advanced, or what is Mirth? If you answer what is Mirth, hopefully we can at least answer that question for you today. Okay, thanks to those of you who answered. It looks like um, most of the folks here have never used it before, um, which is good. So we can kind of give you a rundown of the basics of Mirth Connect. Um, and we did get one uh, question. Um, will there be a link to the recording of this event at the conclusion? Um, no, there will not. We do post the slides, but unfortunately you're gonna have to, to listen to me. I'll try not to be boring though. Let me just go ahead and close that poll. Okay, so 
first, I just wanted to go over some of the specs for running Mirth. So Mirth can run on Windows, Linux, or Mac OS. Um, one of the best things about Mirth is that, you know, it's open source. So you can really just follow this link and download the most up-to-date version for free if you haven't already. As far as database requirements go, uh, Mirth Connect server requires a database for its configuration and message store. Um, so for quick deployment and testing, the installer package, which is listed above here, um, is actually packaged with an embedded uh, Apache Derby database. Um, however, it's not recommended to use that Apache Derby database as um, a production level database. So Mirth recommends to um, run production instances either off PostgreSQL, MySQL, Oracle, or SQL Server. Um, MERS supports all major data types used within healthcare, you know, delimited text, HL7, V2, and V3, uh, DICOM, XML, and JSON, um, you know, and it also supports all major protocols. So, you know, really anything you need to send or receive messages by, um, MERS has support for that. So pictured here is the MERS dashboard. Um, which shows deployed channels and tracks their deployment status. So the term deployed, which you will see referenced quite a bit in Mirth, basically means a channel or interface that is live and ready to receive, send, or perform some type of operation. So if you were to undeploy a channel, it more or less means inactivating it. So within the dashboard, we are also able to view connection status um, as well as message statistics, such as how many messages were received, filtered, queued, sent, or aired. The Mirth Connect panel in the upper left uh, serves as a home base of sorts when navigating through Mirth. So everything one needs to start down the path of developing or monitoring in, uh, channels can be found here. So in addition to the dashboard within Mirth, um, there's also a standalone web dashboard, which allows you to take a quick glance at current and lifetime statistics of deployed channels without actually logging into the engine itself. And the next piece we wanna talk about are channels or interfaces. So again, we can access channels from the Mirth Connect panel and this will show all channels regardless of deployment status, uh, data type or description, et cetera. And within the channels, um, they have four configuration tabs, summary, source, destination, and scripts. And so I'm gonna go ahead and explain what each tab's function is and then take you into Mirth to see a basic setup of each. So first up we have the summary tab. So if we log into Mirth here and we select the webcast channel, we can see our summary tab. And so the first section of the summary tab we have is channel properties. So channel properties includes name, it's pretty self-explanatory, it's what you want to name your interface. Uh, data types. So if we click on set data types, this is where we define um, what type of message we're receiving and what type of message we're sending. So in this instance, we're expecting to receive HL7 version two as well as send HL7 version two. And so, you know, if we were to make a transform transformation from HL7 to let's say XML, this is where we would define that. Uh, dependencies um, really allow you to configure custom libraries and code templates to be included on specific connectors. Nate's gonna to touch on this later. Um, initial state, also pretty self-explanatory, just is your channel gonna be in a started status, a pause status, or a stop status when you deploy it? Um, and attachment. Attachment's pretty interesting. Um, this actually allows you to temporarily extract attachments from a message. So maybe you have a really large um, uh, payload, you know, base64 encoded data, or maybe you have an image embedded within a message. Um, you know, some of those messages that you get with, you know, 
multiple TIFF pages or something like that um, could be huge. You know, it could be you know 15 megabytes. Um, so what this allows you to do is to temporarily remove that attachment. Um, you know, which allows you to process that message a lot faster. Um, and you can store it or you can just completely discard it. Um, so next up in the summary tab is message storage. And Mirth kind of has an interesting uh, concept as far as this goes. Um, you know, with other inter interface engines, usually, you know, you may just have like a spec document that gives you some um, some guidelines to go by as far as, you know, um, what you should keep and, and uh, whatnot, but Mirth actually kind of has uh, settings. So here we're set on development. There's a production setting, raw, metadata, and disabled. So develop. Um, I'm sorry. So development is obviously the most robust. Um, you want to see what everything is doing. You know when you're first creating an interface, but once you're satisfied with the product, you can actually drop it down to production, and you know save on uh, storage space. Um, also, message pruning. So message pruning refers to storing message message metadata and content. Uh, this can also be understood as purge settings for message logs. Um, you know, metadata refers to anything logged within the channels, so you'll see that in a little bit with uh, variables. And then content refers to the message itself, and Nate's going to talk about that a little bit later as well. Uh, next up is channel tags. So channel tags is uh, pretty cool in my opinion. Um, so channel tags allows you to um, filter in the dashboard. So let's say you had, you know, 30 result interfaces and you want to take a quick look at all your result interfaces without having, you know, all your other channels um, kind of distracting you, I guess. Um, you can filter on that within the dashboard and look at all um, uh, channels with a similar tag. And lastly, custom metadata. Um, so custom metadata are columns within the Mirth database that are indexed. So adding these to a channel will assist when searching for messages in the message log. Um, so how we would do that is, you know, a good example of this is uh, patient MRN. So, you know, let's say this happens all the time, right? So a, a provider says, I didn't receive a result on this specific patient. So you have to go into the engine and try to find that message and see what happened to it. Um, you know, we want to be able to search on MRN. So what we could do here is define a column called patient MRN. And we can give you know the same name to our variable. And within the channel, which I'll show you later, we'll be able to dynamically set the value to patient MRN, so that you know when we are looking for a patient one, two, three, four, five, we can actually put in that value and search for it in the message logs. So next up um, is the source. So source um, really defines how the channel receives data. Um, so there's various types of uh, connectors available in the dropdown. So all the communication protocols that we talked about, um, you know, we can define how we want to receive data. Um, so for right now, I just set it on a TCP listener because that's a really common one. Uh, you know, here we can see that there's, um, you can define your port, um, define, you know, if you're processing batches, um, something kind of neat that I've, well, I don't want to call it neat because it's burned me before, um, but transmission mode. So we can set it to basic TCP or MLLP. Um, and actually within the transmission mode settings is where you would define your start and end characters, um, you know, which is really important because if you don't define these, um, the engine won't really know where a message starts and where it stops. So we'll have a lot of trouble processing and parsing that message. So like I said, that's burned me before. So decided to highlight that for you. Um, and also, you know, within the source tab, there's a lot of connection specific settings. So, you know, here we chose a TCP listener. So we're going to set it to a, a mode of server, meaning that it's, you know, waiting to accept messages. Um, you can set buffer size and, you know, keep alive. 
um, if we were to set it for maybe um, a database reader, you know, this is where we define our um, connection parameters to that database. So next up is the destination. And destinations really determine how data is sent from the channel. So, you know, previously we had source where it determines how data is received. Destination uh, determines how data is sent. Um, you know, so we have the same connector types. We can send data out to a database, uh, to file, um, uh, TCP, et cetera. Um, we can also have multiple destinations in a channel. So, you know, if we were to add one here, we actually see that this checkbox here um, shows up, wait for previous destination. Um, you know, so this is important. So maybe you have a order of operations that you need to follow when you're processing a message. Um, you know, the first destination may add a value to some dictionary table, um, and the second destination, um, you know, utilizes that value or um, references that value that's been added. Um, so this checkbox is really important. Um, something, you know, I also find um, pretty great about Mirth is within destination settings, um, there's an option to queue messages. So, you know, we have the options of never, on failure, or always. So if we select on failure, and we can take a look at the advanced queue settings. And so here we can define our retry count, uh, retry interval, and then there's this called rotate queue, which I think is pretty great. Um, what rotate queue means is if, you know, we set it to five, let's say, um, with a 10,000 millisecond retry interval. If our particular message um, exceeds that retry count and we have rotate queue set, what will happen is that message will actually be rotated to the end of the queue and the next message up will be allowed to um, attempt to process against the destination. Um, so this is pretty interesting. I haven't really seen something like this before. Usually if you have a message that's, um, you know, fails and is stuck in queue, um, you may have to go in and actually manually intervene by removing that message. And last up for the tabs are scripts. So there are four types of scripts, deploy, undeploy, preprocessor, and postprocessor. Um, we don't use these a ton um, in work that we've done, um, but I've seen them being used before. So for example, uh, deploy. So what this really means is the script executes at deployment. So this is usually used to set up um, channels, define global variables, or create shared connections um, as a channel is deployed, so as it goes live. You know, the next option we have is a script for undeploy. Um, and this executes when channels are shut down or undeployed. And so this could be used to perform cleanup. Um, so maybe, you know, your deploy script creates a connection and your undeploy script closes that connection. Um, the third option is a preprocessor. So preprocessor um, executes as a channel receives a message. So this is typically used to remove invalid characters and can be a lot more efficient than using transformer steps kind of um, further into the, the life cycle of the message in the channel. And lastly is post-processor and this executes after all destinations in a channel have processed. So this is really used to create a custom response. And a use case we have with post-processor is, you know, let's say we have a hospital and the hospital is querying patients um, from an HIE that has an MPI. And a lot of those patients may be opted out in the HIE. So, you know, as we receive that message from the hospital, we don't just want to send back an ACK or a NAC to them. We want to send them an intelligent message that um, really tells them what's going on. So with a post-processor processor scripts, we can create a custom acknowledgement or response, um, you know, saying patient has been opted out. Oh, 
Okay. So next up, message templates. So there's two types of message templates. Inbound, um, which is used to analyze data from a message to set filters and create transformer steps, and outbound. Um, outbound def defines the format of the outbound message. Um, so we haven't had too many uses for these other than it being really helpful when we're building out filters and transformer steps. Um, so I'm going to show you how to use a message, message template um, next when we jump into filters. Okay. So filters are a series of rules that determine how to route messages. Um, they're all Boolean expressions, so if the output is true, the message will be processed. And I promised I would show you how to use message templates. So here, you know, we have a random test message. And I was practicing earlier, so it's already in there. But we can go ahead and just post that message in. And if we click on message trees, Mirtha is going to parse that message for us. Um, you know, and really down to the the actual value in it, which I think is great. Um, so let's set up a a quick filter. So let's say you know we only want to accept SIU messages in this channel. So what we can do is go to add new rule. And we have a couple different options of how we can create this. Um, there's the rule builder UI, which I think is the easiest. So I usually use it. Um, JavaScript or external script. External script is pretty much the same thing as JavaScript. It's just that the actual code is external to the engine as opposed to being within Mirth. So if we select Rule Builder, um, we have our you know conditions down here that we can choose from: exists, not exists, equals, not equal, contains or not contain. Since we want SIU messages, let's select equals. And so here, you know, if we know that you know SIU is in MSH9, we can obviously just kind of expand the tree and drag it over. Um, what we could also do if you know we're not sure exactly where it is, but we wanna we know the value of SIU is within that message, we can type an SIU into the filter, hit match exact, and it actually brings us right to it. And if you're lazy like me and dragging and dropping is too much, we can actually right click and do filter by value. So if we click on that, it's gonna generate um, our filter for us you know, have our, our path to the message, to the field, we can select equals, and then we're going to give it the value. So here, you know, we're only going to accept messages that equal SIU. And the cool thing about Mirth is even though we're using the Rule Builder UI, it's going to generate the code for us. So, you know, if we want to move to kind of teach ourselves how to use JavaScript, um, this is telling us kind of how to do it. You know, if MSH9 component 1 equals SIU, return true in the Boolean expression. Otherwise, return false. So next up, transformers. So uh, transformers are steps that are executed on messages in order to transform, extract, or create new messages. So if we jump back into Mirth, and right below our filter, we can click on Transformer. So there's a couple different types of transformers. So here we can see there's a mapper, a message builder, external script, JavaScript, and XSLT step. So mappers. Um, mappers are used to extract field data from a message and then save it as a variable. Um, and we have multiple variables that we can choose from. So the first one is a connector variable. And so what this means is it's a variable that's available to later steps in the same transformer. So kind of limited scope 
um, that this variable will be available for. I'm going to say variable avail available a lot, so I'm going to try not to trip over myself too much. Um, next up is channel map. So channel map means it's a variable that's available later in the same channel. Um, so this could be in you know multiple destinations. We can call that variable multiple times. Uh, global channel uh, map is available to all parts of a channel. So source, response, um, scripts, whatever. Um, global map, it's a variable that's available to all channels. So um, kind of like it says, it's a global variable. And then lastly, response map, uh, variables that are only available um, to create those custom acknowledgments. So let's say, um, so we had our patient MRN uh, custom metadata example from before. So here we can still use our message templates and we can go down and grab our mapping. So here's our, our uh, test patient's MRN. We can drag and drop this into our mapping and then we can call it patient MRN. And so now we've, we've assigned a value to that custom metadata variable that we had before, so we can search on um, uh, MRNs for messages. So another type of transformer is the message builder. So message builders are used to update values in the message. So, you know, here's where, um, you know, I'm definitely going to use the, the message trees. So let's say um, we wanted to set our outbound MSH4, just a really arbitrary example. We want, we want to set MSH4 on our outbound message to whatever value is coming in MSH, MSH3 on our inbound message. So that's really simple. We just do it like that. And also within the transformers, um, Mirth generates the script for you. Um, the next type of transformer is a JavaScript. This is kind of our preferred um, transformer because it allows us to do um, mapper uh, functions so we can set variables and we can also uh, manipulate those messages like the message builder is doing. So uh, right before I get into this, let me just discuss the other two real quick. Uh, external script, like I explained before, is basically the same as JavaScript. The code is stored externally. And then the last step is the XSLT step, where um, this is really just used to convert data formats, so like XML to plain text. But if we go back to JavaScript, um, here's where we can use this reference tab, which you may have noticed before. So before in our mapper transformer, we set a channel variable called patient MRN. We can do the exact same thing in the JavaScript. So here we can filter, and we found put channel variable map. So we can drag and drop. Key refers to the name oops, of our variable. And then value, we set that to, I think it was PID3, so we can just drag and drop our field into there, and we'll add a little semicolon at the end, and bada boom, we've got our channel variable. Um, and I mentioned we could also do the same thing that the message builder is doing in JavaScript. So here, we had that we wanted to set our outbound MSH4 value equal to our inbound MSH3. So we definitely like using JavaScript um, most of all because I mean we can set 50 different channel variables in here if we want to and make a make a ton of changes to the messages and not have you know 50 different steps up here. Okay, so next piece, code templates. So what I just showed you here in the reference is the Mirth defined uh, functions that are available. Um, what code templates are, are user defined functions. So here, um, 
this is pretty much all Nate's doing. Nate Nate loves code templates. He doesn't even like them. He loves them. Um, so with code templates, um, you know, these are functions that we can define, that we can write, um, that can be used in our JavaScript um, base filters, uh, transformers, and scripts. So really the purpose of this is to limit the amount of visible code, um, limit instances of repeating ourselves with code that, you know, is used in many different channels, um, and it's really considered a best practice. So with the configuration of these, um, there's libraries. So this is something um, relatively new to Mirth, um, where we can define different libraries so we can, um, it's a way to organize our code templates. So you can see here we have date functions, mapping functions, uh, miscellaneous, which we should really rename, um, store procedure definitions, and translation tables. Um, you also have the ability to select the type. Um, we've always used function. Um, there are the options of drag and drop code block and compiled code block, but we've never really found a use for it. Um, so if anybody in the audience is <laughs> aware of or have used these before, um, please let us know. Um, then we have our actual code. So, you know, we can just kind of write our JavaScript in here to perform the operation we want to happen. Um, and lastly is our context. So context um, is where we can define what components in Mirth have access to the code templates. So we can um, give access to global scripts, channel scripts, um, sources, or destinations, and um, kind of drill down within each to um, you know, do just filters or transformers and destinations, dispatcher, or the response. So I'm excited now because that's more or less the end of my piece, so I get to put all the pressure on Nate. Um, but before I do that, I'm going to release one more poll that I'm hoping you'll answer for us. And this poll is, which interface engine does your organization currently use for integration? And if you have multiple, um, you know, feel free to select multiple. Um, options are Mirth, Rhapsody, or CIE, Ensemble, which is uh, made by Inner Systems, ConnectR, CorePoint, Cloverleaf, Iguana, or other. And I'll just leave this open for a minute. Okay, uh, thanks to everybody who answered that second poll. Um, it looks like we have a lot of Rhapsody users uh, in the audience today, um, as well as a good amount of Mirth and uh, Ensemble. Oh, and I guess we could only select one engine. So, sorry, <laughs> made a mistake there. So, uh, Nate, I'm gonna hand it over to you and close the poll. So let me just uh, give you a presenter. That's important. Thanks, Ryan. And thanks to our audience as well for answering these questions so far. So I am going to now get started by talking a little bit about um, the different maintenance features that Mirth offers. And there are really a lot. And it's really beneficial to have, in many cases, for troubleshooting and for channel development and many other reasons. So the primary, the, the primary maintenance feature that we have, and I think that all of us who use interface engines are familiar with, is the logging screen. In Mirth's case, it's called the channel messages screen, and it's accessed via the dashboard on the sidebar. So this screen really shows the entire history of messages that have traversed through your channel um, it shows which messages have succeeded and which messages have failed. 
And um, in the event that you're trying to look for a specific kind of message, um, like Ryan said, um, you might be looking for messages of a specific patient or that fell within a certain date range. Well, Mirth provides a variety of search filters. Right up top, we have here a start time and an end time of our search. We can also search with a text field. So we could type right in here a patient's MRN number. And if it was anywhere within an HL7 message, for example, that would come through, then we could catch it and we could find that message. Um, we can also search for messages based on their status. So if a message erred, um, or we want to look at all the messages that have erred, we could check this box here, hit our search button again, and now we'll only see where messages went wrong. And uh, maybe that can provide a particular hint or we can look at patterns more quickly. And um, if there is something that is really important that um, you would want to use in order to find messages, Ryan had mentioned earlier the, the concept of metadata. Uh, metadata would be an additional column that we would have here and these columns are indexed. So to speed up the search, if you've created that metadata column and and you've applied the mapping to it, you can use the advanced button here. You could type in what the metadata value would be that you want to look for, and the search would be far faster to return results than to just instead um, have typed in a text field or a text string because messages can be very long, and if you have thousands and thousands of messages a day, um, to search through every single message for a text string can take quite a while. Um, one more thing that is particular neat, particularly neat about this is um, let's say that you found a message that failed. For example, I have here one that caused an error because no patient matches were found. Well, that could have been due to the fact that the, um, the patient's MRN number was not one that was in the, uh, the destination system, for example, uh, an EHR. Well, let's say that you went through and you, you want to fix that message. Um, you could either reprocess the message here so you wouldn't have to go back into the external system, whatever had sent this message across. You could reprocess right here and um, your message would reappear if you were to hit search and would again go through each destination. Um, and with each destination, you can see what was the message in its raw format as well as what were the mappings, so any of those metadata values or um, JavaScript variables that you've defined. And if there is a, an error that's caused perhaps by um, a JavaScript bug, so a bug in your code, Mirth makes it really simple for us to find what line in our JavaScript code the error went wrong, and it even provides a stack trace. Uh, so that's a, a programming term that, that is used to explain how um, a programming system can return all the different lines and functions within functions within functions where the problem has occurred. So overall, it's just a really important screen for us to find errors, to find messages, and to find out um, what went wrong. And on a similar note, if uh, an error did occur, we wouldn't want to rely purely on that dashboard to find messages. We would actually want to be alerted to it as soon as possible, especially for some cases. Um, and here's an example. So we would want to set up an email alert in the event that a channel had trouble connecting to a database, a database where your incoming HL7 data needed to go to in order to populate some sort of section within EHR, like an appointment. Well, let's say that you had an appointments channel. You could specify that you're going to create an alert for that, that channel, and you can pick where within the channel you want to look for errors. Now, you could look for any error, so errors that occur anywhere within the channel, or you could specify, for example, a deploy script where maybe in a deploy script you had put in your database connection object and if that failed then you would be alerted that there was a problem and that's an alert that you certainly want to know. You obviously don't want your database to be down for too long. And on the bottom here we have um, a few more options so we can specify who is to get an email alert as well as um, what that template, what that email text is going to look like. 
So Mirth conveniently provides for us alert variables, things like the date time and uh, what channel that problem occurred in, or even better, um, what was the error message itself, so that if you have a support staff or you have um, an interface manager, that they can be alerted and they can see that message. And one more um, useful screen in terms of logging and, and, and alerting would be the event log screen. And this is more specifically for system level changes um, and problems. So let's say that Mirth restarted overnight and no one is really sure why or when that happened. Perhaps um, you had a network outage and Mirth subsequently lost connectivity. Well, this would be a great screen to go to because we can see at what time um, Mirth would be shut down and we could perhaps see um, some more specific information. So in the event that someone has modified a channel, you can see what user modified the channel. Uh, you can see the IP address that they were connected from. And one other example that is particularly useful is uh, if a data pruner job had run overnight. So Ryan mentioned earlier, earlier data pruning. Well, this is one way to know that indeed that job is running. So speaking of data pruning, um, we wanted to jump in a little further into these particular maintenance features because they're really important. So message storage um, provides a slider here where we can, in a sense, move around the level of detail that we care about for this channel and all of its messages that it receives. As Ryan mentioned, a message has both metadata and it has content. The content would be the HL7 message or the XML message or the CCD that came through while the metadata would be additional layers of information that we might have added, um, like that patient MRN column that Ryan had done. So it's really important to use this effectively per channel. If you have a channel that, say, uh, handles CCDs, well, a CCD can be pretty hefty in size. It might be five megabytes or more. And if your channel then has multiple destinations, well, that 5 megabytes in size can now multiply to 10, 20, 30, 40 megabytes or more. And all of a sudden, this one simple message is now taking up a lot of room on your server. So you might instead choose to only store the raw content, so the original HL7 message or CCD as it came through, while preserving all of the metadata. And this slider really gives you that flexibility. Another thing that we have is the pruning options. So with pruning, MERS provides the capability of automatically deleting data after it reaches a certain age, if you want it to. So um, if you do have a channel that is inundated with traffic, you probably don't need to store that message forever. Um, you know, after it reaches seven days, we could delete the content, delete the HL7, but perhaps preserve the metadata if we have it to be stored indefinitely. So that you would always have at least a simple logging that a message had come through. So the idea here is to pick that sweet spot that allows you to have enough time to troubleshoot your messages, but to not hold on to them for longer than you need them. So with that now, I'm gonna briefly pause and I'm gonna hand the presentation over to Ryan so you can ask the audience one final question. Thanks, Nate. Um, so this last poll is um, really short, straightforward. It's just, is your organization currently evaluating a migration to a new interface engine? So I'll just leave this open for a moment and then hand it back over to Nate.
Okay. Thanks of uh, thanks to those of you who answered. Um, quite a few looking for a migration, um, and about half the audience is is good with uh, what they have now, which is great. So Nate, feel free to take it back over. All right. Thanks, Ryan. So next up, um, we're going to jump into a little demonstration here of a channel that um, that we've developed and that can pretty much highlight the the primary reasons you would want to use mirth or that mirth might be handy to you. So in this particular scenario, what we have is um, an inbound scheduling channel. So a channel that is going to receive SIU messages, SIU HL7 messages, and it's going to hit a channel in mirth and that channel is then going to subsequently look at the HL7 message, pull out important pieces of information, and then curate an appointment in the EHR, which in this case is going to be the All Scripts Touchworks EHR, via leveraging certain stored procedures, which are database queries that come with All Scripts, that All Scripts itself uses um, with ConnectR or Rhapsody or any other interface engine. So I'm going to briefly run through the channel setup. I'm going to send a message to MERS and um, show how that message gets processed. Once that message has gone through all the destinations in the channel, we'll be able to look at um, the message, uh, the, the appointment actually, in the EHR. So let's jump over now to that channel I've been talking about, the inbound schedule appointments channel. And let's take a quick look at some of the options that we've picked here. In this case, we've gone with the production message storage. You can see that it's selecting for content or preserving for content the raw message, any encodings it took on, as well as how that message looked when it was sent, meaning when it completed the destination, and what the response was. So if it sent anything back to the, uh, the source, as well as all the mappings. And for metadata, we're going to hold on to everything. Same thing here on the pruning side. We don't want to ever delete our metadata in this case, but we do want to prune messages once they reach a certain age. Now under source, what we have is a TCP listener, meaning that for the IP address of this environment, of this server, on this port number here, Mirth is going to be listening for any incoming HL7 messages at which point it is then going to run through these four um, destinations that are going to be displayed in a second. Just having a quick little um, connectivity problem right now. Let's give it just a quick moment. Sometimes our internal system here does have a little bit of lag time. Sorry about that. It's taking a little longer, but I'm going to um, hit that server one more time from, from outside. And what we're going to see in these destinations are the various different stored procedures that we end up calling um, in order to uh, in order to see individually at the message as it gets processed through um, the different stored procedures. So I've just reloaded the client now. Let's give it one quick second.
All right, sorry about that, guys. I think we're good now. There we go. All righty, so here we are now in the destination screen. So we can see four different stored procedures that we need to use here. Now, these include, like Ryan mentioned, some dictionary focused stored procedures. So if we get an HL7 message and we've never, in the EHR, has never seen that appointment type before, then we can add the appointment type to the Allscripts dictionary. The same thing for insurance classes and referring providers. Finally, once these three process, then we can go down to the bottom here and you can see that check of wait for previous destination. We can then create our new appointment. We now have all the information that we need and we can add it. So each of these destinations, as you can see, have some filters and some transformers. Um, I'll look at quickly some of these filters. So in this case, we have a filter that's checking to make sure that SIU is in our message. This is done to ensure that we're only processing messages that are SIU based. We also have a transformer, and this is for us what's particularly important. The transformer is where we take the parameters that are required by the stored procedure that we want to call and we pro provide it with a mapping, we provide it with a value. And in some cases, these values might be hard-coded in, might be constant values, but in other cases, they could be pulled in from the HL7 message. So you would see in here uh, things that have to do with the start time and the end time um, of a message or of an appointment or the patient, MRN, et cetera. Finally, at the end, for each destination, we actually make that stored procedure call. And as Brian mentioned before, I truly am uh, a big fan of the code template uh, feature of Mirth. So you can see here that we have four channels that are doing the same exact thing. They're trying to execute a stored procedure, and if there were any errors, to handle them in a way that we needed to. So these are code templates that we've written that inside contain tons of and different logic um, and error handling and it's really neat to minimize sort of the visibility to that and keep everything abstracted somewhere else so that we can modify something in one place instead of in several. So now in this section here we're going to try to send a message across. We're going to simulate what it's like for the channel to receive an SIU message and then what it will subsequently do with it. So what I have on the side here is a um, sample HL7 message. And just like you can reprocess messages, you can actually uh, send messages to the channel instead of having to go to your external testing system. I'm going to paste in here that HL7 message, and I'm going to just very briefly highlight some details about our message. So you can see here that we have a comment saying, uh, this appointment, we're, we're testing a new appointment. You can see that um, we have perhaps a, a type of appointment. And in here as well, we have the date range, um, or excuse me, the exact date that this appointment would be on, which would be on December 4th. Um, this is what an SIU message would look like, for example. So with all this there, we're going to process the message. And now if we refresh the page by hitting the search button, we're going to see um, now uh, the different things that have come through and how the message processed and we can find, see now that there was an error and we can find out why. So let's find out what was wrong with the message. Well we've seen that there's an error and we can take a look over at the response to find out what may have been wrong. Well neat, okay so it's telling us that the appointment type DE lookup failed, that uh, there were no matches found. So this is really handy for us now to go back and look at our HL7 message and, and fix that. But um, to save some time, we can also see one that was successful. So similarly here, we have a raw message. You can see that a lot of the content is very similar, but the appointment type in here is one that is already in the system. Well, we can go now and we can look for that date, which was December 3rd. And I have here the EHR. I'm going to go in now and I'm going to pull up the schedule. 
but it looks like we're having again a little bit of lag time here hopefully not as long as the last one just one quick moment Awesome, much quicker. Okay, so we're here now. We're going to take a quick look at the schedule. Um, the date range that we saw for that message was December 3rd. If we go to this provider on December 3rd, we can see here that we have, um, we have our appointment. And um, it was for this patient. It had this appointment type. And there's our comment again that we were looking at before. So with that now, we, we've taken a quick look at what an example of uh, a channel could look like and what it's like for a channel to receive a message that potentially it's unable to process, as we saw with the one I had sent, where the appointment type was not in a dictionary and there was a, a potential issue. So um, let's recap now by going back to our presentation and just doing a, a final sort of pass through again of why mirth is pretty neat. So as we've seen, mirth is a very flexible and accessible system. It's free. You can download it right now. You can quickly spawn it up and, and, and create new channels. And really the barrier of entry is low for mirth, which is really awesome. If you want though, you can, um, you can get a paid license, which adds a, a couple of additional features, primarily 24-7 support with Mirth. And, you know, there have been plenty of times where I and, and, and engagements I've been on in the past with Mirth have, have needed that sort of assistance from Mirth itself. Um, things that are perhaps Tier 3 support where we've encountered a bug with the application itself and, um, and Mirth with that support. Um, sort of a support agreement is very quick to respond and, and to help us out. You'll also find online a large community behind Mirth. So people who, who are just like you or just like me who are working in Mirth every single day and uh, are asking questions and wondering how to do things better and more efficiently. Mirth, uh, the support team they have there, they also are really quick to provide feedback and responses on there whether or not you're a paid user. And um, if you need additional assistance after what that community can provide and what you can find online, well, Galen is, is poised to help you out. Um, we've done a variety of projects now. I myself have been on several where we can help you perhaps, you know, install a new Mirth environment if you haven't had one before and set one up and create interfaces for you. If you're migrating from a different interface engine, like Ryan mentioned ConnectR, well, we already have a solution built for you where we can do that. We can do it quickly. And if you, you do want to reach out to us at the end of our presentation, we do have some contact information. So now, finally, we, we have a few minutes now where we want to answer some of the questions from the audience. And um, if you haven't already, please feel free to jump in and, uh, and type one in on that bottom right corner um, of, your, of your screen. I'm going to stop sharing for just a brief moment. I'm going to take a look now at some of those questions that we've received um, and let's see what we got. So one question that, that we did get, um, which was, was great, is if you curate a channel with a source TCP listener, for example, the channel that, that we were demonstrating before, um, can you send a response message back? And it, for example, acknowledgement or, or no acknowledgement if, if there was a problem? Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, as we saw at one point during the demonstration on, on the logging screen, you can, um, you can look at what those responses look like um, and you can define an acknowledgement. Um, the next question that we have here is, what are some of the features that come with a pro license? Another great question. So besides what I mentioned before about 24-7 um, support, we also have uh, additional things that only pro users can get. Things like 
plug-in functionalities. Um, if, a, if someone in the community develops um, additional plugins that MERS itself has not built, only pro users can see them. Um, and that's pretty cool. Additionally, we have advanced email alert options, so things like escalation levels and email groups for certain times of the day. So let's say that you have um, folks who on your support team who manage the interface, the main interface engine during the day and other people who work a night shift. Well, you can customize at what time of the day should what people be getting message, messages, which is really cool. And finally, just a few more things that the, the pro um, license offers, I believe, are um, LDAP authentication, so using your Windows login instead of Mirth, as well as um, a central screen, actually, to manage SSL certificates. So if you um, have any of your channels running through an HTTPS connection, well, they normally are managed individually on each channel. You would input the SSL certificate, but with the Pro license, you can actually have one central screen where for all of your channels, um, you can, in one place, manage the SSL certificates. Next up, um, another question that we have is um, what security features are offered with MERS? Well, MERS uh, has, has, gives you a lot already. First off, in terms of message security itself, MERS stores messages inside a database um, that you would set up during installation. So as long as you set up your database, securely with all the best practices, you would be good on that front. As for message transmission to and from MERS, well, you have the flexibility to um, communicate via HTTPS, as I mentioned before. You can take an SSL certificate and you can add it to your channel, and then whatever um, communicating system that you're using, both inbound or outbound, can leverage that certificate in order to provide encryption. Uh, on that note, you can also, using Java and JavaScript um, code in your channels, you could handle the encryption and decryption yourself if there was a specific way uh, that you wanted to do so. Um, but I think we've already written extensively on this topic, so um, we have a few white papers and, or and blogs that you can take a look at on our website. And uh, those are definitely worth checking out to learn more about Mars security in general, as well as many other little tips and tricks that we've seen over the past few years. Finally, I think we got a few more great questions here. Um, one question we got was, does Mars have a lookup table to translate a value? It sure does. Um, not, not in the, perhaps the traditional sense, if, if you've used ConnectR, um, ConnectR comes with its own concept of a, a translation table, but what we've done in, in our case is we've created a code template um, for each of the translation tables that we want. So really, a code template really ends up becoming something that looks like this, a, a function where given a value, it would return something else. And this is just one way that we've defined it. So you have the flexibility with JavaScript um, to use these kind of lookup tables or translation tables. Um, one other question that we got here, I'll, I'll pass this one over to Ryan because he's an, our resident expert on, on Fire, but does Mirth support HL7 Fire? What do you think, Ryan? I wouldn't call myself an expert. Um, but so yes, there there is a plugin out there. I believe it's for um, a listener, and it's available for download. Um, I'm not sure if it's act, if it's on the website um, or if it, there was almost like a press release after a connectathon. Um, so it is available though to to install on a, I think it's a 3.3 version of Mirth. So short answer, yes. <laughs> Just do a Google search for it, and you should be able to find it. Yep, absolutely. I believe um, Merth was one of the first companies to to really get behind Fire, and, uh, and I think that's great. Okay, so 
I believe that's all the, the questions that we have. Um, again, if, if you ever have any more questions, you can reach out to us um, here via this, this web page and, and via um, contacting us as well. On our website, we do have a, a contact us page where you can reach out to us and, and we can provide additional assistance. And um, as we mentioned before, um, Galen is, is ready and poised with so much experience already in working with Mirth to help you out and to help you with any migrations or further development work um, that you are you know, getting ready to do and, and, and to get started on. So please do reach out to us. And, and again, thank you so much for joining our webcast today, and, and we hope that, that you learned a lot. Thanks again. And I think people are starting to drop off, but um, there was one other question that I just saw. Uh, could you show us how to remove a special character that might come inbound in PED segment or patient's name? Um, so I can do this real quick. People are starting to already drop off, but sorry. I don't know why I ask people to do in either chat or Q&A, because then we miss some of them, it seems like. Um, so if what I would probably try to do first is to do this in a preprocessor script. Um, so the this is a you know it's it's it helps you out a little bit here. It's saying modify the message variable below to preprocess data. Um, so I'm not a hundred percent sure, but um, what we could do is just do a replace function on it. And they asked if we could remove an at symbol from the message. And so if we just did a replace on at uh, and um, replace it with a blank string, that should do it for you. Um, I'm not sure exactly how to pinpoint a particular segment in the message. I think for that, we may want to use um, a transformer where we can you know, dig into the, the exact field or the exact segment. Um, but something like this should accomplish what you're looking for it to do. So hopefully that answers your question. Um, but yep, thanks. Hope you enjoyed it.